Um, today, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Tania Lurman, who is uh, the Howard and Jesse, Jesse Watkins University professor at Stanford. Before being at Stanford, uh, Tanya Lohmann was at the University of Chicago and before that at uh, UCSD. She's uh, specialized in anthropology and cognitive anthropology. She's written numerous books, uh, some of which have actually received uh, various prizes. So let me mention two of them. Of Two Minds, who was a book on anthropology, who, who won a few prizes. And the last one, it used, well, the last non quote book in 2012 was When God Talks Back, which is an amazing book, which I highly recommend if you, uh, if you uh, haven't read it. It's just absolutely fascinating, uh, which won many prizes. In 2012, it was on the list of notable books of the year by the New York Times. And in addition, between 2010 and now, it won three or four, or maybe even more prizes. It's really just fantastic read. Uh, it's also not only interesting, important, but also it's just quite, quite fun to read, uh, but when you don't belong to that culture, really when you're an outsider like I am, you just get an insight into the mind of people who are very different from you, which is just, just really outstanding. She has tons of awards, she has won tons of awards. I won't go through her very long CV. Uh, just, I'll just mention she won a Kugenheim, Fel Kugenheim Fellowship a few years ago, and she's on many editorial boards. And we're really delighted to have her today to be talking about uh, local theory of mind. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I should tell you. Yes. Oh, one more thing. Please. Sorry to interrupt. Um, as we usually do, we're going to record the lecture. So, uh, and the uh, lecture is going to be about one hour. So, for one hour, please turn your cell phone off. Avoid standing up. And if you need to leave the room, just crawl. Uh, don't, <laughs> don't do it by, by standing. As we usually do, we'll make a break at 3.30 and we'll have a 15 minute break. There will be some at 4.30, there will be some refreshment uh, and food in the lounge so that we can pack up uh, the recording materials. And then we'll come back for Q&A after 15 minutes. Right. Thank you very Great. much. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, it's very exciting to present these ideas to philosophers, um, and I'm really curious to hear how, how you will respond. Um, oops. That's actually the... the, the um, <coughs> all right. That's the title of the, the talk. Um, I'm going to talk about theory of mind, so let me begin by talking about what people usually mean by theory of mind, um, which is this. Everywhere in the world, between the ages of two and four, humans develop the ability to infer that other humans have beliefs, desires, and intentions, mental events that may be different from their own. And so the classic paradigm is the false belief experiment. Then this is, uh, pictures it, there's an experimenter and a toddler, and, uh, and a third party, who in this case is Bert. And all three of them together hide a toy, and then the experimenter takes the third party away and then the toddler and the experimenter hide the toy in a new place, and the experimenter brings back Bert, and or the third party, and says to the toddler, where do you think Bert thinks the toy is hidden? And very young kids have a kind of, re what Henry Wel Wellman would call a realist bias. They assume that what's true in the world, which they know, everybody knows. So they point to where the toy really is. Older kids, point to, this, to the first hiding place because they know that Bert's had a different experience. They have developed what psychologists would call theory of mind. But note that what we actually see them doing is we see the kids inferring, believing, intending, desiring, mental events. The word mind is the word that we use to describe the collections of mental events. And one of the things that anthropologists have known for a while but haven't really done anything with is that in different parts of the world, those collections of mental events are imagined a little bit differently. So um, I'm actually going to set out an argument today for the claim that the, um, these different theories of mind, what I'll call different local theories of mind, shape the way that people experience invisible others, the invisible others of psychosis, people hear psychotic voices all over the world, and the invisible others of God, and people hear God's voice all over the world. Um, but what I'm really going to do is talk to you about the pilot data that I've been doing for a large project. With, and then the data from the larger project isn't yet in shape to share with you. But what we've been doing, we've got five 
postdocs in different parts of the world, and the question is, do different representations of thinking, different local theories of mind, different ways of thinking about thinking, do those shape the way that people experience in those invisible others and supernatural experience? And so because you're philosophers, I thought I would take just a few minutes to set out how we're thinking about how to compare the mind, because that's not a straightforward thing to do. What we do is we kind of, we try to bracket what we take to be the psychological and philosophical model of the mind and see it as something that Euro-Americans think about the mind with more expertise on the part of philosophers and psychologists. And we say that, look, the human terrain of what of this mind-like stuff is mental stuff, thinking, believing, intending, wanting, feeling. Feeling is sometimes a little like that and a little different. Some kind of sense of awareness of awareness. And then we say, okay, these human experiences, they're represented in different ways in different worlds. And sometimes they may be mapped as part of the body, sometimes they may be mapped as part of the supernatural domain. Um, how do they do it? And so we can tell a story about the way that Americans do that, about Americans have this kind of private citadel of the mind. It's really, really important to us what we think is who we are. It's really important to share that with other people. And I'm going to make the argument that, according to the ethnographic literature, you know, Ghana and the South India, other parts of the world will do it a little differently. But so our postdocs are trying to map these local, the local theories of mind. So how do we do that? Well, we begin with the presumption that all humans have conflicting intuitions about thoughts. That all of us uh, have the, the intuition that we can and cannot know what other people think. We all have the intuition that wishes do and do not affect the world. That, you know, you, you, you kind of ha might have a game that stepping on the crack is going to break your mother's back. You don't really think that's true, but there's a little piece of you that even in our worlds, we're a little worried about that. Um, we believe that, we, of course, we believe in America that we generate our own thoughts and feelings, but we also have the intuition that when, um, you know, you, a song just comes to you, a poem just appears in your mind, that somehow it came from the muse, it didn't come from you, or anger washes over you, it came from out of nowhere, it wasn't you. And we have the intuition that thinking is part of who are part of our bodies, and somehow it's fundamentally different from our bodies. And we assume that cultural, what I'll call cultural invitations, tweak these intuitions. They don't remove the conflict from any human. We think about them as cultural intuitions, rather cultural invitations, because I don't think that culture is like a cookie cutter. It doesn't determine what you think and how you behave. Some invitations are stronger than others, but they're kind of, and, and they're not confined within national boundaries. There are lots of local cultural invitations in different parts of the world. One of ours is sticks and stones can hurt, can break my bones, but words can never hurt them. That's an invitation to think that this immaterial stuff of words and thoughts isn't really real in the world. What matters is physical stuff. As we unpack, well, as we have pursued these questions, we have done something very clunky, but we think useful. So we have said, okay, how are we going to ask about these these ideas about thinking, feeling, whatever these mental these mental things? Well, one of the things that varies around the world is the question of whether the the domain of the mind is bounded from the world, fundamentally different from the world, or whether your thoughts and feelings can kind of leak into the world, and whether your mind is vulnerable to the way that other people think about you. So this is the domain of, of, of magic and witchcraft. Um, are, are, it, does your local world imagine that there are some people whose anger and envy can kind of seep out and without you saying any or doing anything, it can hurt another body? Are you li do you live in the kind of world in which you're afraid that a sorcerer may, will make you fall in love with somebody because they'll plant that concept in your mind? That's one kind of dimension we ask about. Another kind of dimension we ask about is what I'll call interiority, because um, that's what my anthropological tribe calls it. What are the social expectations of how you should share inner thoughts and feelings? So are you in the kind of world in which when you make a friend, you really should share what you're feeling because that's what it is to be authentically you, 
Or if you're in the kind of world in which you worry about sorcerers and witches, you might think that sharing inner feelings is, is not such a good thing to do. And the other dimension that we ask about is, uh, is imagination. We ask about that because we're in, one of the things we know is that only some parts of the world encourage kids to play at fantasy play. So only some parts of the kid, every, everywhere in the world, kids play at imitating adults. And adults may or may not participate in and encourage that play. The idea that a kid should play at something that's really not true is highly valued in America, highly valued in Silicon Valley, <laughs> not so highly valued other parts of the world. And so these are the domains that we've been asking about and um, that, and, and that um, we can talk more about. Today I'm really going to talk about my um, pilot data. And again, I'm going to make the claim that the way that you think about thinking or the way that people think about thinking in a particular social world changes the way in which they experience invisible others. And I'm going to talk about the voices of God and the voices of psychosis. And I'm going to bracket the question of whether there also is a God who really talks and whether we know when that God talks or does not. I'm going to suggest that there are that these two domains this is, this, this is a world full of many, many arguments and scientific controversies, but again, but my own view is something that I'm going to share, which is that the, roughly speaking, the, the domain of psychosis is different from, from many, many people who hear God speak audibly. So there's a story about psychosis. So these are people, when they hear voices, they sometimes experience the world as if their head is full of a in, inside of a beehive of, of noisy, arguing, commanding beings. They have an array of auditory and quasi-auditory events. Um, they can hear voices all the time, 100 times a day. Um, what they hear is sometimes two words repeated, you know, don't touch, stop that, stop that. You know, oh, so, but sometimes they hear sentences and conversations and paragraphs and a lot of stuff. What they hear is often bad, so bad that it is. some people will say that the negative voices are an intrinsic feature of the experience of having schizophrenia. When folks hear God and they don't, in any obvious way, meet criteria for, for a serious psychotic disorder, what I find is that most of the time what they report is rare. They report one event, maybe two events, when they have had an auditory or quasi-auditory experience of God. What they report is brief, four to six words at most. So the people will say they've been driving down the road and God spoke up out of the seat behind them and said, I will always be with you, or I love you, or yes. And what they experience is startling, but it's not negative. People might pull over to the side of the road and weep, but they weep with joy. So let me talk a little bit about the, the, this voice. And the, the point I'm trying to persuade you of in the next 10 minutes is that these kinds of events ought to be the kinds of events that respond to training, invitation, proclivity. They're, they're, they're malleable in the world. So, voice of God, what am I talking about? I'm going to start by, by uh, um, describing one of the, my Sub fieldwork subjects. This is a young woman who graduated from UC Santa Cruz, and the best job she could get was um, the morning shift at 7 11, which did not excite her. One morning, this woman came in and she looked like she'd been up all night. She looked like it had been rough. She threw her stuff on the counter two six packs of Miller Lite, some cat food, and a food product of some sort donuts, I think. And she looked at me and she said, Hey, can you get me a carton of cigarettes? And I'm thinking, excellent, this is what I want to be doing with my life. So I turned around, rolled my eyes, and I started thinking my judgmental thoughts. In that moment, I literally heard the voice of God say to me, do not judge this woman. I have created her in my image, and I love her. And poor woman, I, I, I almost fell over. I, I'm like trying to give her change, and I'm like, whoa, the voice of God spoke to me. I have been changed ever since. Somebody else you recognize? When Martin Luther King sat at his kitchen table in the winter of 1956 on the eve of the Montgomery bus boycott, he was terrified. He had gotten death threats. He was worried about what would happen with his family. He sat at the kitchen table and he prayed. And he said that Jesus came to him and he heard his voice saying, I will be with you. And he went forward. So what do we know about these, these brief, 
rare non-negative events. I think we know that they're phenomenologically salient, phenomenologically distinct, they're socially salient, they're associated with mental imagery practice, and they're associated with absorption. So what do I mean by that? And here I'm drawing from my long experience <coughs> of talking with people with psychosis and people with, who, who talk to God and hear God talk back. So, so they're not as a physically oppressive. Here's one of my subjects who says, I'll be watching TV or I'll be, I'll be doing my artwork and I'll hear stuff. It's almost like they're using the physical properties of heat, light, and sound and they bounce something off here like a signal. Here's a Christian. I was at the grocery store and it, w it wasn't like this audible, but I felt I, God did a hiccup or something. Somebody with psychosis. Hearing voices is like a hostile takeover of my mind. Christian. It certainly wasn't unwelcome. It's not a sense of taking over. The Christians. In general, there's no bright line between no, no phenomenal logical event that belonged to psychosis that does not, get, does not re get reported by people without psychosis as far as we know. But in general, with these rare events, the Christians do not report murmuring they don't report voices talking in the next room. They don't revo report voices talking to each other. They don't re report this weird, strange whispering. Voice of God is socially salient. This is a young woman hearing God talk back. What she is doing is she is searching in her mind for thoughts. She's trying to, dis she's trying to discern whether God has spoken to her in her mind by looking for a thought that's popping into her mind, that's spontaneous that is the kind of thing that God would say and that gives her a sense of peace or joy. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that. Sometimes what she hears is auditory. So I've talked to, systematically talked to about 200 Christians about this and about a third of them have said at one point or another they've heard God speak in an auditory way. They don't expect that to happen. So if you read the manuals, so this is a kind of a one of the, the manuals on how to dialogue with God. The manual says God's voice normally sounds like a flow of spontaneous thoughts rather than an audible voice, but it happens. One of the things I know is that the, these experiences are associated with mental imagery cultivation. So people who are praying in a world like this do something that they do in many different religious practices, and it, which they're using, they're having a daydream, a, a, a vivid kind of what, what some people call a God dream. They are sitting on a park bench, they're walking with God, they're standing in the throne room trying to feel the heat of his presence on their cheeks. They're using their inner imagery. And what I, I saw as an ethnographer is that people report, they'll come to the church, they don't do this kind of stuff, and they'll say that over time, that they will experience sharper mental imagery. They'll say the things that they have to imagine, like God, because they can't, God's invisible, become more real to them. They'll report more voices and visions. And I've done experimental work in which I've randomized people to prayer and non-prayer prayer and found similar results. The people who score more highly in absorption are more likely to report these rare brief events. So absorption is a pen and paper measure devised by Aoki Telegan and, and, uh, and Atkinson in 1974, meant to be a pen and paper measure of hypnotizability, correlates highly with dissociation. It picks up trancy kinds of stuff, and it seems to kind of pick up people who like to be caught up in their inner imagination. So bunches of questions, true or false for me, the more trues you, you give to this scale, the more you're likely to report that you ha you've had some kind of voice or vision, some kind of unusual sensory event. And one of the things that we know is that absorption kind of hangs together with whether you report that God is present for you like a person, whether you have vivid mental imagery, inner, men inner uh, imagery, whether you have unusual sensory experience, you hear God speak, and, or you hear your mom speak and she's not in the room, something, a weird sensory event, and whether you have the kind of William James experiences that people deem religious, sleep paralysis, out-of-body experiences, sense of presence, all kinds of weird stuff. Training also predicts this. So both absorption and prayer practice predict these things that travel together and kind of hang together. So the point I'm trying to make is that these, these, these rare, brief, non-negative events 
I don't think this is a way that people have of talking. I don't think this is discourse. I think this is a phenomenological event in the world and that you can say something about the circumstances which are more likely to give rise to it. So what might explain why these events happen? I'm just going to wave my hands um, and tell, and read, this is Augustine who's about to hear Tolo Lege, is who will be converted to Christianity as a result of hearing this, audit, this auditory voice of God who says, take it and read. What, is, what does the scientific literature say to us? Well, there is a, there's at least this argument within the literature um, called reality, as usually described as reality monitoring. And it says that what happens whenever you have a mental event, and I would love your sense of whether you believe in this theory or not, whenever you have a mental event, you, are, you quickly, quickly examine that event. And you ask at least two questions. You ask, is this a thought or a percept? Did it happen in my mind or did it happen in the world? And did I generate it or did somebody else generate it? You can answer those questions differently. The argument is that you always ask those questions and the, the research suggests that if, that the answer depends in part on sensory cues. So if you have a thought about your colleague and you can remember the, light, the way that light falls upon her face, you're more likely to say, oh, that was a memory of my conversation, rather than I, inv I made up this conversation. So the sensory cues are doing something. And what I think, and again, I'm doing a little hand waving here, I think there's a story here that I'm trying to understand more deeply, that the ways of, of micro-attention, that the way somebody identifies mental events <coughs> alters the way they're experienced, and the, my hypothesis is that culture plays some role in this process, and the different models of the mind are part of, the, part of this cultural domain. So this is what I see. I see that I've got a bunch of empirical uh, data that supports this, but this is, what I, this is the broader claim, that sensory attention to inner mental events leads to those events seeming to be more external, more in the world real, and generates more judgment that an inner event is non-me or perceptual rather than thought-like. Okay. So now I'm <coughs> going to talk about theory of mind. So I did this work that I'm about to describe on the basis of reading the literature. So I did not do any independent work. That's what we're doing now. We're going to the around and we're talking to people about how they think about thinking. But this is what I get from the literature, that in the States, um, inner experience <coughs> is central to your sense of self. It's in some sense, what you think and feel is who you are. That's really important. But the mind is supernaturally inert. We are, do not socially, culturally support the idea that, what, you know, that your anger or your envy will affect somebody's body independent of anything that you do. We don't worry too much about people placing charms in your mind. And we have a very highly developed idea that our mind is separate from our body. People talk about this as Cartesianism. I mean, there's dualism everywhere. But, there's, but you can make the claim that there's a kind of heightened du Maybe you can make the cultural claim that there's a heightened dualism here. One of the things that you see in the literature in, in India is the observation that the inner experience of others is really, really important. So in this book about Chennai, mm -hmm. minds is clear that, that what seniors think about juniors juniors might infer as more important to their future than what they think about themselves. And it's, it's their job to figure out how the way seniors think about juniors. You can also infer that controlling your mind is really important. You can make the claim that the mind-body division is perhaps a little less dichotomous than it is in, uh, in America. In Ghana, one of the things that you can say about the literature that's quite clear is that whatever individuals might believe in that social world, they will know that there are other people in that social world who think there are special people who's, and when those special people who are often called witches in English, when those special people have anger or envy, they can really hurt somebody else. They can kill somebody else. And there is, the literature suggests that inner experience is represented as more bodily. So words for mind often have a bodily dimension. Um, and, um, and people will talk about the mind more like a supernatural weapon. So that lurks in the background literature of the ethnography and history of Ghana. So 
I want to talk to you about some interviews that I did in Ghana, in, in Accra, Chennai, and the United States, and then I'll turn to psychosis. But I wanted, so I'm going to, um, so I'm going to talk about hearing God's voice. I spent time in churches that were very, very similar, and of course no church is similar to any other church, but my tribe says that this particular kind of Christianity has a more portable culture than, than others. These are new charismatic evangelical churches. Their church, the churches that I went to are middle class, English speaking, I spoke to everybody in English, and they, they have many formal similarities. And But one of the things they all shared is the sense that God is a friend, and God is meant to talk back to every person in the congregation. And what we did, or what I did, is I took 34 interviews in the United States, actually not done by me, but using this particular protocol, and this in a church that I knew really well, which was the Vineyard Christian uh, Fellowship, which I'd written written a whole book about. Um, we taught, and we we took these interviews with committed Christians. I went to Chennai and to Accra to similar kinds of churches, and I t in each of those churches I talked to, ten to 20 committed Christians, typically for one to two hours. I asked a bunch of questions, but I asked, always asked about how people prayed, how God spoke to them, I asked for examples, and then I asked about a series of William James experiences, including what I call sensory overrides or visions and voices, hallucination-like events, and presence, out of body experience, the sleep paralysis, near death experience, all that kind of stuff. So let me tell you a little bit about content differences in what people say about what God says. So when everybody says that God speaks to them in the mind, but the Americans, and this is my reading of the transcripts, Americans place themselves in, in a narrative frame and they often present a back and forth dialogue. I said, God said, I said, God said. Here are two different people. This is a guy who's, who's talking, he says, well, it was straight to the point. And this is God who says, dude, you need to, you got to, this is the only way. So often a little informal, often a little funny, um, often a little self-centered. Um, okay, and here's this woman. And she says, I, I, I felt I, I didn't hear the audible voice, but I felt God just say, you don't reveal yourself to me. I reveal myself to you. And I was like, really? And then God says, I'm the onion. I'm the onion. And I was like, wow. <laughs> she was seeing that kind of onion down to the core billboard. billboard. OK, Chennai. Chennai folks do plenty of this. But they also a little bit more talk about hearing God through people. So here's a young man who says to me, for me, exactly, I would say like last Christmas, my wife wants me to get something good, something for her. She wants a mobile, a mobile phone. I was telling my wife, yeah, I see God is like telling me this, just wait for it. Just wait, God says, just wait. They begin to set aside money. One of their friends can't pay her mortgage, so they then give their, friends, their friend the money they've saved. Then a different friend of theirs has an extra, turns out to have an extra mobile phone which he gives to them. And this young man says to me, so I thought, okay, thank you, God, for giving me this advice, because God also speaks to us through people, through some people. Accra, same story, but a little bit more. You get the story of, of talking to God, and God talks back, but also through the external Bible. So this is some, a young man, another young man. So I was lying on my get bed and I start talking to him. It's awesome. I can talk to God like I'm talking to you. And as you're responding, even though I don't hear your voice, it comes. I'll ask this question and then he'll point me to a scripture I've not thought about. So God will drop a scripture reference in his mind, he'll open the book and read the reference. And that's God talking back. So what do I feel most confident about? I know how weird the Americans are. So I feel confident that Americans do more mental talk than other people. They do more, nar there's more narrative engagement, there's more u comfort in using in the mind imagination to experience God is real. Americans really like this. The other thing they do is they think it's really weird. So it's they, again and again they say, this is crazy, but I'm getting an image of something that God's giving me. You don't need to call the white coats for me. <laughs> it blew my mind. God's so weird, et cetera. And there's a lot of self-consciousness that God, what you take to be God's voice 
could be your own thoughts. So there's a lot of awareness of your mind between yourself and God. Your mind is intervening. So like the, on the bottom, it's very clear what God says. But sometimes I have to say, am I just making this up? Is it God? Because I've, been, I've misinterpreted things in the past. Okay. So these more rare events, when God speaks in a way people can hear with their ears. Um, so, ask about this. This is, this is uh, Blake. So for, this is the way I ask the question. Now I'm going to ask you about some unusual experiences. Sometimes people experience them as spiritual and sometimes not. Some people hear what seems to be a voice when they're alone. Sometimes when they're falling asleep or waking up or even when they're fully awake. Has something like this ever happened to you? They give me an answer, and I have follow-up questions. Would you say that you heard that with your ears? Was that outside your head? Do you turn your head to see who was speaking? So I try to get a sense of the auditory dimension. And then I say, have you ever heard God speak audibly to you? So what did I find? A third of the Americans say that they've reported some kind of experience like that. Um, when they do that, they mark it as weird. I don't know, those events are just weird. I just assume I'm nuts. So there's some kind of weird caveat that this is not a normal event. They're very clear, very comfortable with my question. They're very clear about whether this was in the mind or in the world. I, I'm exaggerating. People will often say it was in the mind. It wasn't in the mind. I'm not sure I heard it with my ears. But they're very clear about the idea that there's a boundary line between the mind and the world. When God speaks, it's often very, often very casual. He corrects somebody's spelling at, at one point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Americans don't talk a lot about sleep. So Americans uh, do talk about sleep. These events are very common on the edge of sleep. Like 40% of people, if you, uh, in, in Maurice O'Hayan's work, will, will report some kind of hypnagogic, hyp hypnopompic experience. But Americans don't articulate that very, it doesn't pop up in the transcripts super easily. Chennai, 45% report that God has spoken back in some way they can hear with their ears. The, none of them talk about being crazy. They are more likely to talk about hearing God sing. They are also more likely to do something that's kind of interesting in that they'll mark out a part of the mind that's not the mind but not the world and there's something in between. So there's a more kind of quasi bodily dimension. And they'll say things like, not audibly, not in my mind, not in my inner. Wide awake inside of me strong. So I don't, didn't mark those events as hallucinatory or hallucination-like events. But let me just give you a feel about the way people are talking about their mind to give you the sense that there's a difference. Here's Pastor Jay. I was, cl very, I was clearly hearing the voice of God saying that this question was put into my ears very clearly. And so the anthropologist says, did, did you hear it with your ears? Yes, yes, with my ears. Oh, audibly. Audibly, I heard it. I heard this question. And then it goes on, like, forever. Which, and we can talk about this, I, I think that that's a very rare human experience, to hear that much um, audibly. And so I say, that's amazing. So did you, like, turn your head to look to see who was speaking? Or did you just kind of know it was God? And, he's, and then he goes on into this, like, no, no, what I mean by audible is not a sound that's coming from the outside. It's, I could feel like I'd really know in my spirit sense this question is coming from my mind. So that, that's just something I want to note is something idiosyncratic about the way that these subjects spoke. Akra. 55% say they've heard God speak in a way they can hear with their, with, with their ears. There's no talk about being crazy. Um, there's lots of sleep talk. Often I'm into these transcripts and I'm, I'm, I'm reading somebody and, I, and it, takes some, it takes a couple of sentences to figure out that they're talking about a dream rather than the talking about an awake experience. So sleep is in and out of these transcripts and in, in and out of my conversations in a way that's quite striking. There's much more comfort with auditory experience. Uh, there were three people who talked about hearing God speak audibly once a week or, or more, which is unusual in the American context, in my experience. And, and there's, there's kind of a, a, a default interpretation of hearing God's voice as external. So let me give you a feel about how this works. And this is relatively early on in my interviewing uh, experience when I'm uh, with a group of these, these young Christians. I'm so, talking to this young, young woman about hearing God speak, and I say, 
And how commonly does it feel like that's almost auditory or, or actually auditory so that you can hear it with your ears? And she says, as soon as I'm conscious of it, and I, the American anthropologist, break in and I say, oh, that it, it stops. And she says, shakes her head and she says, no, as soon as I'm conscious, and I'm conscious of, that I'm hearing God speak, I hear it. So I then interpret her gestures to get it into the transcript. And, and I say, oh, you mean then it pops out and it becomes more auditory? And she says, yes. So again, quite striking, as if there's this presumption, this ease and a presumption of auditoriness. So, what do we see? We see that in the US, 35% of my, my subjects say that they've had an auditory experience of God. 45% in Chennai, 55% in Accra. Um, I have a little bit of support for this. We also gave surveys to the local undergraduates, none of whom were our subjects and none of whom I actually met. Um, and so there are 120 subjects, three countries, and one of the questions was, have you ever heard a voice when you're when alone? And 44% in the, in the US said yes, 56% in Chennai, and 90% in Accra. So there seems, there's, there's, so that the bias, if you call it that, that shows up in the interviews also shows up in the survey. And I would say that it is robust in these next rounds of interviews and, 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 and questionnaires that we're do, doing as part of this larger Templeton project. So what are the principles? I think that what I, what I see is that um, the more the mind is supernaturally inert, which usually travels, I think, with the idea that inner experience is about authenticity, about being who you are, you should share your inner experience, the more God's voice is internal rather than external, the more emphasis on the internal dimension of God's voice. I think you also see that the less people report, talk about sleep, the less they report God's audible voice. I think that the sleep talk is not sufficient to explain the difference in voice hearing. So you could push back on that, but I think that but I, but I think that the the two of them travel to, together. I think that there's a story, a cultural story beyond just a different emphasis on sleep experience. I do think that sleep. From what I know, sleep in um, Accra and Cape Coast is really, really interesting. As we've started doing some systematic surveys, as far as I can tell, not one person reports that they consistently sleep for six to eight hours a night. They consistently report biphasic or multiphasic sleep. And they sleep at many different times. So this is the story I'm trying to build towards. I'm trying to make an argument that the a local theory of, I'm trying to make an argument about kindling. That, so that practices make certain experiences more fluent and more habituated. And I think that local theory of mind all affects the way mental events are salient. I think this may affect micro-attention. And I think that these different patterns make some experiences more fluent, more habituated. All right, psychotic voices. I think I can do this in 10, 10 to 15 minutes. All right. I talked to, uh, and I want to re report uh, some published and unpublished work. You're going to hear a repeat. Um, but, uh, okay. So I, I did a, a study with colleagues in, um, also in the South Bay and Accra and Chennai. We talked to 20 people in each setting. Uh, we tried to be really careful. My uh, Tamil speaking colleagues talked to the folks in, in uh, Chennai and Tamil, and then I come in, talk to a bunch of them in English, talk to a bunch more, uh, more of them. I go in with a Ghanaian research assistant into the psychiatric hospital in Ghana. We do the interviews. I go away. I send her in to do a bunch more interviews. So we try to make sure that, 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 that they're, um, we try to be as careful as we can. Um, the, the interviews last for 30 and 60, between 30 and 60 minutes. Um, there are two things. We ask about a bunch of things. I want to draw your attention to two things. One is the question of whether the person knows in the flesh the, per the being whose disembodied voice they hear. So have they met the speaker of their voice? And is what the voice says, is it positive? Is any of it positive? Here's the caricature of the difference. Americans hear horrible voices telling them that they're worthless and they should die. 
Africans hear an audible god who tells them to ignore evil voices, and South Asians hear annoying relatives who tell them to get dressed and to clean up. <laughs> it's, um, so, a little more depth. To Americans, hearing voices means that you're crazy. This is extremely robust. Almost every single interview subject says this. I didn't tell them I was hearing voices. I was afraid I might be called crazy. In America, the voices are often unknown. Sample of 20, only three people out of the sample say that they know the person who they hear talking to them. In America, the voices are often, um, are often violent. So this is quite striking. We know this changes with time. Um, this is a guy who says, you, it's like torturing people to take their eye out with a fork or to cut somebody's head and drink their blood, really nasty stuff. Only one, not one American in this first sample said to me that their dominant or only voice was positive. Not one American. I've now talked to 60, I have a couple. Chennai, over half the sample, here's kin. So that you have a father, you hear your father talking to you. You have a brother, you hear your brother talking to you. And you might hear other relatives as well, some of them dead. Kin do what kin do. They tell you not to drink, not to smoke, to clean up, to behave properly. It's very annoying, but you might like it. So over a third of the sample says that they like the voice even when the voice says annoying things they wish the voice would not say. They like the social company of the voice. When the voice is mean, um, the voice talks about sex. Now it does this everywhere. But in Chennai, it was particularly striking that the voice would socially shame someone. So somebody would get, on to a, would get on a bus or they'd walk in public and the voice would, in their experience, would look around and say to the bus, the bus full of people, everybody knows that you're masturbating. Akra, hearing a voice does not mean that you're crazy. You can there's a notion of a spirit, uh, uh, there's a kind of a spiritual idiom in which, he you know, f hearing voices can be a demonic attack. More known voices than in the American sample, um, so seven out of the 20. Half the sample reports that their only or their dominant voice is God, and they report that they really, really like the voice. So people say things like, you know, my, this is multiple gods. They just tell me to do the right thing. If I hadn't heard these, had these voices, I would have been dead long ago. That's what's kept me alive till now. It's the voice of God that I hear that's keeping me alive. Gonna, and what people say is the voices keep them company. That even if they don't like what the voice says, even if the voice is horribly mean to them, they're likely to say, that the voice, they like, they like the conversation with the voice. So what do we see? We see a story that, I think we see a story that in the US the mind is a private possession. I think what's going on is that people experience voices as a violation. They hate the fact that something is taking over their mind, it drives them crazy. Actually, they actually sometimes say it literally, the voices drive me crazy. Chennai. I think mind is more imagined as a social process, and people experience their kin. And at Accra, I think one of the powerful ideas about minds is that mind affects world. There's a very highly salient notion that you must have a good mind, that being a moral person is very important, and people want moral voices. They want God's voice. So I think here also there's a story about kindling that there's a story about what I would call the affordances, the things that the psychotic mind makes available to be observed. So this is, we know this is true. For many, many people, I mean, voice hearing is remarkably various, but many, many people report good voices and bad voices and loud voices and soft voices and commanding voices and inviting voices and murmuring voices and whisper, whispering voices and all kinds of stuff. And I think that something is going on that leads people to listen in a selective way to their voice hearing, and that habituates what they listen for and start to hear. So now I'm going to move into audience participation for five minutes. So I, I, and I did this work, um, and I was like, you know, I, I, I was curious about what the many ways that I might have gotten these, these interviews wrong. So I went back and I played a, a, a track uh, made by 
Patricia Deacon, who's a, who's a woman a clinician who has schizophrenia, and um, she, she made this track to represent the variety of voice hearing. And so I played it to people. And, and I play, I've played it both in English, and now I've played it in Accra in Pante, and in uh, Chennai in, in English, not yet in Tamil. And I've played it in Shanghai, in, um, in Mandarin Chinese, and in, uh, I have to say that in Shanghai they hear Mao. Okay, but I'll play this now for you. Okay, this is not pleasant. Look at their eyes. Look at them. Their eyes are full of disgust. You have a way to smell. You are disgusting. You are looking at you and seeing you and seeing everything you do. And you are disgusting. Okay, so you get the idea. And I told people that I this was this represented voice hearing. Uh, some people, somebody represented, made this track to represent voice hearing. I wanted to talk to them about their experience of hearing voices. These are all voice hearers that I'm talking to. They're all in the hospital, but they're new subjects. These are not the people I've already talked talked to you about. But so that's what I tell them before you play the track, and then before I ask that question, I say to people, "What do you remember?" And remember, there's a positive voice, I came for you, and there's a negative voice, which is, was really mean. So in Accra, 29 subjects, nine remember some version of I came for you, eight describe it as a movie. Chennai, 27 subjects, seven remember some version of I came for you, 10 describe it as a movie. San Francisco General Hospital, 21 subjects, not a single person remembers I came for you, and nobody mentions it, mentions it as a story, and they hate the track. Okay, what I'm telling you so far is about work done in English. I also did something else because I, you know, because I was so curious. So I played this track, and this is the audience participation part. Okay, so this is a track made by Diana Deutsch from UCSD. All humans. So I invite you to participate in this as a human. All humans are able to hear words emerging from the track. And people hear all kinds of words. But I just want to encourage you to, to listen and let words emerge for you. <laughs> that happened for people? Yeah. OK, anyone want to volunteer? No, you're afraid of it. Don't bend. Tall bend? Well done. Well done. Oh, part of what? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here, the, here's another example. If, if somebody has haven't been able to. <laughs> I heard wanton. <laughs> okay. So, um, all right. So I did it. So that's so common. How many people heard no way? Okay, so that's so common they don't count that in the in the, in the coding. But people hear, hear, hear all kinds of other stuff. Um, so I did something really simple. I said, so tell me what you hear. And I said, are they, do, they, do they report good neutral words like bright light, clay clay, or do they report negative words like he lie, fatal gray, go away, don't fuck with me. <laughs> so what do we see? Accra, 29 subjects. Six people generate negative words. Chennai, 27 subjects, three generate negative words for either track. San Francisco General Hospital, 12, 21 subjects, 12 people generate negative words for at least one track. Americans really do seem to have a negative bias. So again, there's some kind of story about cultural kindling, I think. Some kinds of things, something's going on with culture and the way that we're, we're paying attention to these experiences. And here I'll, cl I'll close with just three slides. Why do we care? Well, it turns out that Americans are more distressed when they're psychotic. So this is pretty robust. So our best data comes from India, 10 part, 10 sites in the West, really two sites in India. You look at people when they fall sick, you look at them two years later. On six different measures, they're 50% better off in India. 
This suggests, my, this work that I've just been presenting suggests that voices respond to some kind of learning and that new interventions that encourage voices, people to, to retrain their voices might have something to offer. The other thing that it teaches us is that Americans may have an impoverished spirituality. We, I think we think about sleep as a biological need. We don't think of sleep as the place where we meet God. Um, we think of internal things popping outside as weird. It's weird to hear God speak into your mind. I think it's quite possible that people discount events that could become powerful, positive experiences for them. And I think this also suggests that this may respond to learning and attention. So I will stop there. I would, should say as an anthropologist, what this says to me is that culture matters. And what's cool about this is that it even can come deep enough to change your fund, some fundamental perceptions. So thank you very much.